All right, thanks everyone. Um, and speaking of commitment, thank you for your commitment. I know this is the last talk of the day. Um, the, the upside to being the last talk of the day is that I know everybody who's in this room really cares about the subject. You're, you're here for a reason. You care about the ecosystem that we're developing. Um, and with that commitment, with enough commitment to stay here right till the end of the sessions. And the upside to that, the other upside to that, is that means that I'm pretty sure nobody will complain if my talk is quick and short and we get it over fast. So yes, I'm here to talk about a renaissance for free space combiners. This is a technology um, that's seen the light of the day before. Um, and we're, we're developing a, a suite of technologies, approaches, and manufacturing um, techniques that will allow us to, to hopefully see a burgeoning resurgence uh, in the use of free space combiners for augmented reality and smart glasses. All right, so I'm pressing the big green button. Is there another one? No, that's correct. Oh, there we go. So a little bit of an overview. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction to Metamaterials, uh, the company that we work for. Um, talk a bit more about volume holographic gratings. Uh, I'll introduce you to the concept of free space combiners and the, some of the appealing characteristics that they have. Describe a little bit about AR Fusion. Anyone who was here earlier in the week and saw Jonathan Waldron's uh, talk uh, in the main ballroom, they would have seen quite a detailed view of AR Fusion. I'm going to give something that's a little bit more uh, of a briefing. And then I'll describe some of the new technology developments that we've been working on over the last little while. So who is Meta? Um, and this is the other Meta, not the big Meta. Um, so we work on delivering what we call breakthrough performance uh, across a wide variety of different applications. Um, the ones that we're going to talk about here mostly involve uh, optical applications, but we have other technologies that are devoted to medical applications, other technologies that are devoted to electrical and electro-optics. Um, we have subject matter experts on a wide variety of topics. Again, uh, everything from optics, to holography, diffractive optics, metasurfaces, metamaterials, uh, electro-optics physiology, tissue interactions, light matter, tissue interactions, that kind of thing. Um, we have over 300 patents, uh, and that's growing very rapidly. And what's relevant to, to a lot of what I'm going to be describing today is a lot of the custom design and simulation tools that we take advantage of to, to design the holographic optical elements, uh, and then design the, the tooling and processes that are necessary to make that an industrial reality. We have, um, speaking of industrial reality, we have lots of proprietary production techniques that we use that are, are quite unique in the industry uh, for taking some of these ideas that we have uh, specifically regarding volume holographic gratings and turning them into something that's useful to the industry. We, we have a real commitment to sustainability, so we put a lot of effort into ensuring that the processes that we develop uh, do, do our best to, to provide maximum performance while at the same time trying to minimize the environmental impact that we have. Um, and on the financial side of things, uh, we're quite proud of the fact that we're the first metamaterial focused company that has been listed on NASDAQ. Uh, under the ticker MMAT. So we're, we're a relatively small company still, growing rapidly, but we have a presence really literally throughout the world. Um, I'm based with the photonics team uh, and the advanced materials team in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's on the east coast of Canada. Uh, that's global headquarters. We have another Canadian location in Burnaby, BC, which is focused on uh, nano, um, nanotechnology, or sorry, nano imprint lithography and other uh, nano design approaches. Uh, that's the R&D lab, and there's an associated manufacturing facility in Thurso, Quebec for high volume manufacturing. And London's the head of our medical devices applications group. Uh, we have another group that started in Athens, Greece, that has similar responsibilities for non-invasive sensing techniques and modalities. And then we have an office here in the Bay Area in Pleasanton, California, whose main responsibility is nanolithographic techniques, particularly one that we call rolling mask lithography. And we're re really quite a deeply vertically integrated company. Um, so we do a lot of raw materials development. Some of that's done in-house, some of that's done in association with our external partners um, with whom we have very close partnerships. Uh, again, a lot of work goes into software and, and design work that we use for simulations and testing. Um, a lot of the focus or some of the focus is working on large area nano patterning approaches that allow us to create uh, nanoscale structures over very large areas at very low cost points. Uh, and that's really important for really democratizing nanotechnology in the way that, that our company is really committed to. And what I'll be talking about today is, is mostly involving those last couple of steps where we're, we're really integrating our functional materials into products into to form factors that are useful to the industry. 
So we, we have, I think for this audience in general, four main technology platforms that I think are most relevant. Um, but I'll really only be describing the, the two on the right here. Again, if you saw Jonathan's talk earlier in the week, you got quite a good introduction to NanoWeb and our roll-to-roll -roll nano and print lithography techniques. But here I'll be focusing a little bit more on AR fusion and particularly holography. So how we can use holographic techniques, particularly holographic optical elements to produce complex diffractive optics that are very useful and have, I think, quite unique properties for, for AR smart glass applications. So to jump right to the chase, why, why bother using volume holographic gratings in any kind of application? Well, the big one at the front there, or at the top, is, is the fact that, optically speaking, they're, they're very selective. Okay? They, they only have really a useful function if you happen to impinge light upon them that has the right wavelength, the right, right color, that is, and has the right angle, angle of incidence. And if the light that's striking the holographic optical element has the wrong wavelength, or it has the wrong angle, then the holographic optical element appears to be just transparent. Okay? And that's one of the big reasons that this, this technology is so valuable in the AR space, where transparency, being able to see through the lenses, is so, so important. Um, so the, again, the idea is that you've got a holographic optical element whose function it is only, which only functions when you strike it with the right wavelength of right light at the right angle. Uh, these are capable of having high diffraction efficiency that can translate directly into high optical efficiency at a systems level. Uh, they can be thin, that translates directly into them being lightweight. Um, we can have multiple functions all embedded within a single, single optical element through multiplexing. And, and because these are plastic film form factors, they're amenable to post-processing through a variety of different techniques, and some of them I'll describe here. So a very brief introduction to the optical characteristics of volume holographic gratings. I've already mentioned the fact that they are very angle and wavelength dependent. So you see a typical transmission spectrum on the left-hand side. So if you, you're shining light, in this case, 537 nanometers, added holographic optical element, and, and you tilt that holographic optical element, you're gonna see very high transmission. So essentially something that's very clear across a wide range of angles until you get, in this case, close to zero degrees, at which point the transmission drops down to zero. And that's just an indication that you've got something that has, again, very high transparency, except when you happen to be what we call on brag, when that diffraction condition, condition is met. And on the right-hand side, you can see you have similar sort of very specific wavelength of, or very specific dependence on activity or action um, in, in the wavelength regime. So if you change the wavelength, um, in this case, at normal incidence around 537 nanometers, again, uh, you can see a very high transparency in the blue down, or, down around 400 nanometers and then very high transparency at 600 nanometers, but almost none. So very good reflection in this case near 537 nanometers. And we, we can put these sorts of plots together into something that we call a dispersion map. And the important thing to see here is that most of the area is white. That means it's transparent. Basically, the light doesn't interact with the holographic optical element or the volume Bragg rating. Only in that black curve is there actually some sort of interaction with the light. And this is one of the key distinctions between this kind of technology and surface relief gratings, which have often many higher order modes that, that can contribute to things like flare, which, which um, decrease or degrade the, the image quality. So we, we've got a range of um, commercial off-the-shelf components that we call hollow optics that are based on volume holographic gratings. Uh, the first are conformal VHGs. We call them conformal because the grating planes that, are, that make up the structure of the volume holographic grating are parallel to the surface of the, of the, of the material. But the important thing is that they, they behave specularly. So they, they behave essentially like a mirror that is wavelength selective. So in this case, blue and red wavelengths pass straight through. Again, it's highly transparent, but the, the green wavelengths are diffracted. And they're diffracted in the form of a mirror. So angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. Now, the second product that you see here, we call these slant gratings. And in this case, they exhibit what's called anomalous reflection. So the angle of incidence does not equal the angle of reflection. And that's a property that we're going to take advantage of in the holographic optical elements. So to come back to what's relevant to this audience, what we care about or what we, we are proposing is, is that holographic optical elements have a useful um, place in as an optical combiner. What does the optical combiner do? Well, it's that, that key element that merges light that's coming from the real world that you want to see around you with light that's coming from the projector unit. And the various different characteristics that you require for that are, well, obviously it has to be transparent. And it's one thing that we firmly believe in that high transparency 
Um, and see-through characteristics are, are one of the key things that, that you care about when you're building any sort of combiner because most of the time the combiner is not being used as a display. It's being used to see the rest of the world. Um, and what goes hand in hand with that is that something like 60 to 70% of the adult population requires prescription correction. And so your solution to the combiner has to be able to accommodate that naturally. And I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more detail that that's a little bit more nuanced than it might seem at first. Um, so again, display quality is, is the second part of it. So if the first part is you want to be able to see through well, the second is that you want to be able to see the display, the, the image that's being digitally projected well. So things like field of view are important, um, the optical efficiency are important, and that optical efficiency has uh, important knock-on consequences to the, to the whole system level design. Um, because something that is optically inefficient requires larger battery life, or sorry, larger batteries, um, or potentially has shorter battery life, um, things that are larger are bulkier, things that are larger are heavier, and you don't want that. So you want to have an architecture in the combiner that combines high efficiency, with, which allows the, the whole system to be therefore more light, um, less bulky, uh, and, and easier for the, for the wearer. And then to skip to the end, there's social comfort's an important part of it as well. Uh, so it's important that people be able to look at, at individuals or people that are wearing the devices and not, not feel as though they're they're looking at something strange. You need to be able to maintain natural eye contact with people without, without flair or other or artifacts. Um, and then another point that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail is that fashion is very important. Style is a huge part of why people buy and, and choose particular types of eyewear. And that's not going to go away just because we've added a display or something smart to that eyewear. People will still care about how it looks. OK, so a little bit of a hierarchy or taxonomy of, of optical combiners. Um, roughly speaking, they can be divided into waveguide or non-waveguide based combiners. Uh, there's been many, many talks over the course of the last couple of days about waveguide combiners from, from very advanced companies doing really tremendous work. Um, but our, our technology falls on the right-hand side here uh, in the category of non-waveguide based combiners in the free space optical elements. Um, and again, in our case, we're working with free space optical holographic optical combiners that are based on volume holographic ratings that I showed you earlier. Okay, so now we get to what is the basic concept. So over on the right-hand side, you've got your projector. The projector shines light uh, at the holographic optical element, which is embedded within the lens. And I mentioned earlier that you can have slanted volume holographic ratings that diffract anomalously. And, and that's what the holographic optical element is. It's an, a volume holographic rating that diffracts anomalously, but does so with spatially varying properties. So it, it not only diffracts the light, it diffracts it anomalously, and it diffracts it uh, with optical power. So it essentially acts as a curved reflector that's embedded into the lens itself that has a different radius of curvature than the, the lens, the physical curvature of the lens. And of course, because this is a VHG and it has these very stringent conditions for diffraction, most of the light from the real world passes right through the lens, which provides very, for very good, good see-through characteristics. So again, what do, what do you get from a free space combiner? You get this high see-through quality. Um, you get a high brightness display because the efficiency can be very high. This allows you to have, you can also have best form prescription lenses. We'll describe that in a little bit more detail. One of the consequences is that you don't have substantial eye glow. Um, in the case of a, a waveguide based design that has pupil replication, a lot of that light for the replicated pupils doesn't go into the pupil, it doesn't go into the, the viewer's pupil, it just falls on the eyeball. And that ends up lighting up the eyeball in a way that looks quite unnatural and very much impedes social interactions with people wearing these devices. Um, and one of the big points is that because the lenses in a free space combiner can be made monolithic, the, the shape of the lens is quite natural. It looks like a normal pair of glasses to people. Um, and because of the manufacturing approaches that are associated with the, the interference lithography approaches that are used to produce volume holographic ratings, they can be produced in a very cost-effective and high-throughput fashion. So um, a word on, on AR fusion. Uh, so again, this is our, our approach to producing ophthalmic quality lenses. Um, and in this case, we're going to take that technology and we apply it to producing lens, holographic optic elements that are embedded within those lenses. So it's a, it's a low temperature, low pressure process. 
Uh, that means that you can take something that is relatively sensitive, like a, an HOE, and you can process it in a way that doesn't substantially affect the HOE properties. Um, it, the approach that we use, or AR Fusion, is, is very much an automated approach. Um, so there's, I'll show a movie in a second, but that, that automated approach means that you can have high throughput um, and very good quality over uh, control over the devices that we're producing. And one of the very important characteristics for the supply chain that we're envisaging for, for AR combiners is that post-processing is done through all the typical tools that are used in the, the ophthalmic industry that already exists. So once the lens comes off the end of the line, all the um, processing associated with things like surfacing, coating, and edging can all be done on tools that already exist and are very well developed. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're bringing to AR Fusion is a whole series of new custom developed and application specific resin chemistries uh, to really optimize the performance of the various devices. So this is a movie, and guys at the back, if you could just click play on that, please, that describes how AR Fusion works. Um, the process is, is relatively straightforward. There's a selection of molds. Um, oh, that's great. I didn't even realize the sound would work. So there's a selection of molds. Um, those molds consist of a front side mold and a back side mold. This mold assembly machine puts those molds together with a well-defined gap between them and a well-defined orientation. They're simply taped up, and then UV curing resin is injected between, between those molds into the cavity. So here you can see it's filling from the bottom. This takes a few seconds. Once that's done, the mold's taken and put, in into, put into a UV oven. Where it's exposed, that UV resin is cured. And then the glass molds are removed from the piece of, of plastic. And from this point on, all of the post-processing can be done, again, using standard ophthalmic techniques. Okay, so together with the holographic recording approaches and the AR Fusion um, technology, we're really proposing or, or putting ourselves forward as a one-stop shop for holographic-based combiners. Uh, we have a very close collaboration with Covestro to do application-specific um, material development on the photopolymer side of things. And then I already mentioned the resin development we're doing on the lens casting side of things. And the idea is that customers can come to us, customers do come to us um, with, with designs of their own, and then we're able to implement those holographic element designs uh, in, in lenses that are essentially ready to be popped into frames. Now, one of the questions that people have about, about the free space combiner approach to holograph or to AR combiners uh, is the eye box. Um, so the, the title of the talk alludes to this. This is not a new technology. This is something that's been, been tried before. Um, now, and the main or one of the reasons that people have concerns about uh, the eye box and a holographic free space combiner approach is that Retinal scanning approaches in general have very small uh, exit pupil, uh, unlike a waveguide which has a very large exit pupil. So the consequence is that, is that you cannot have one size fit all users. And our approach to that is simply to, to have mass customization. Um, this is being leveraged and been made possible by the fact that the recent um, development of of progressive lenses, freeform progressive lenses, means that the ophthalmic industry in general requires very high precision position of wear information to be taken on patients before they can be fit for prescription uh, progressive lenses. And so that means that there's already a, a thriving ecosystem out there of, of manufacturers or, or um, of software companies, really, that are developing the techniques to do virtual try-ons, uh, where you can essentially use your, your phone to scan your face identify exactly how a virtual pair of glasses will sit on that face and then uh, be provided a prescription with freeform progressive lenses that fits you exactly. So we can take that exam exact same technology and we use that technology to develop um, the formula that, that identifies the optical function that's required of the hologram. And that optical function can be tailored to meet the requirements of every user. And from a manufacturing point of view, this is perfectly aligned with the way that every pair of of prescription lenses is currently produced. So at the moment, every pair of lenses that's made to RX is made to an individual user's prescription and to an individual user's position of wear information. So all we're proposing to do is add the holographic recording part of that 
to, to the same process flow. And individualization also means that you not only put the eye box in the right place, it means that you can cater to the needs of individualization for fashion and style as well. So you see you've got a bunch of people here, they're all wearing the same glasses, this looks weird. Right? You put 10 people into a room, everyone's wearing a different shirt and everyone's wearing a different pair of glasses. That won't change when we move to smart glasses and display technology. So this individualization approach to producing holographic elements naturally supports the, the needs of style and fashion because style and fashion requires that you fit to individual frames and you fit to individual prescriptions as well. And just a quick word on, on AR fusion and prescriptions in general is that prescriptions, again, the vast majority of adults require prescription correction of some form or another. It's not enough to have just a prescription that works at normal incidence. The ophthalmic and the eyewear industry in general has uh, developed over 150 years worth of practice what they call best form prescription lenses. And you can see up on the top right side, there's many different ways of satisfying one prescription. But what shows, what's shown in the bottom right here is that there's only one that can, constitutes the best form that gives you not only good visual acuity at primary position, at forward gaze, but also gives you good acuity in the peripheral region as well. The ophthalmic industry, the dispensing industry, expects that when a, fulfill, or a prescription is fulfilled, that it's fulfilled to best form. And our lenses support that best form because they're um, monolithic pieces of or plastic that are surface and finished in standard ophthalmic ways. So this is what we have in mind as our vision for smart glasses. We're looking for smart glasses that are lightweight, the, the sort of glasses that you can wear all day long. What's needed for that is efficient displays or efficient combiner technologies. Um, the field of view should be optimized for an informatic display if, you're gonna, if this is something that you're gonna be wearing all day long. And, and first and foremost, this is a piece of eyewear. This is something that you're wearing to see the world and to either improve your vision or to just see the world in general. Um, so it has to be optimized to have the quality and aesthetics that are required or expected of eyewear. Um, again, efficiency contributes to a design that can be bright enough to be seen all day, outdoors, even without dimming. And the individual, sorry, individualization that's required supports not just the, uh, putting the eye box in the right place for, for individual users, but also supports the needs of fashion and prescription as well. So finally, a couple of quick words on new things that we're working on. Uh, so to support eye tracking, we're, we're doing some, some really advanced work on near IR holograms. Um, this means that we can take a lot of the technology that I've just described that is applicable in the RGB regime and move it all the way up to the near IR. Uh, so this is the sort of technology that's really appropriate, again, for eye tracking. And, and we're also, also deeply developing what we're calling holographic coatings. Uh, so Covestro now supplies us with liquid, form, liquid supply form photopolymers that can be applied to a variety of different surfaces. Um, these maintain all the same holographic characteristics that you'd expect from Bayfold type materials. And so this will allow us to apply um, holographic materials and geometries that have previously not been possible. And so just a bit of word that, uh, that this is, it's not just a PowerPoint uh, slide, this, there's, there's reality behind this. So I'm currently wearing a, a set of glasses that has one of our holographic optical elements embedded in it. You may have seen glints of green, those represent the, or those are from the fiducials that we put in for, for testing purposes, but the holographic optical element itself is, is almost invisible. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a moderate myope, so I've got a minus 3.5 prescription with some cylinder, um, and I'm press biopic as well, so I, I have a progressive uh, prescription, and that's all been surfaced into the eye side of this, this lens. Um, and the lens weight is comparable, as comparable to the sort of weight that you'd expect from a traditional um, eyewear lens. So this is not something that's gonna be big, bulky, and heavy, and, and feel strange and unusual to a, a user. Uh, and of course, it meets all the sorts of standards that you would expect for typical eyewear. So just a way of, of emphasizing that this technology is real, this is something that we're bringing to market, and we're working with the OEMs to ensure that this is, this is the kind of technology that will enable the all-day wearable smart glasses that people are looking for. With that, thank you very much, and I appreciate your stamina. Any questions? Yeah. Dimitri? So in your case, you already have uh, the lens in your glasses, but you don't have a projector. What's the use case? Uh, uh, is there a use case without a projector? That's uh, one question. No, um, in this case, it's, it's just a way of demonstrating the utility of the, the combiner. Right. Um, 
and really to emphasize the fact that, again, 95% of the time, the projector won't be operational on an all-day wearable device. So what matters most is your ability to, to get through the day with the, in my case, pres prescription correction that I require and, and the good visual acuity that I expect from a pair of glasses. Our next step is, to, is that we are putting together a reference design that will show the, the display quality as well. Got it. What, what's the temp, uh, how the temperature of the environment uh, impacts the optical properties of the lens? Yeah, there is a shift that's due to the, the environmental temperature. Um, there's a coefficient of expansion. Right. Uh, this is something that we, we accommodate for on, with our partners on the projector side. Can you dynamically change the, uh, the physical properties of the, uh, of the gradient? Uh, not, not with this kind of grading. So there are certain forms of grading that are based on polymer dispersed liquid crystals uh, that are electro-optically right. electro active. Those mm -hmm. are something that can be tuned. Uh, but for this technology, where really we're emphasizing uh, good visual clarity, we're emphasizing manufacturability, uh, no, they're static. Uh, one, Keep one, it coming. One last question. Uh, what if the, uh, how much of a cost will it add? The, uh, it's a polymer, right? So it, it supposedly will not be an expensive component, right? What, what's the economics on that? We're working out pricing models at the moment, so I don't want to commit to anything. But as you say, that these are polymer-based devices. Um, the, the competitive technology for waveguides is high refractive index glasses. We're very confident that we'd be extremely competitive relative to that kind of technology. Are you providing the prescription glasses yourself? You're making them yourself, or are you partnering with others and sending you a waveguide? So, no waveguide here. This is a holographic optical element embedded into the glasses. Um, we, so there's a couple of different models that we have in play right now. So at the moment, we're at the phase where we're doing small volume manufacturing, and we do essentially everything in-house. So I mentioned that we've got, uh, well, this, this activity is based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're, we have the equipment there and the facilities to do volumes up to, let's say, 50 to 100,000 units per year. That would be done in-house. Now, there are various different distribution models that are possible at larger, let's say, major OEM kind of levels, million units per year. Um, so the most straightforward one is everything is done at a centralized location. You do your facial scan. That gives you your position of wear. You submit your style requests. You submit the prescription. It's done at a central location, and it shows up in the mail two weeks later. Uh, the Warby Parker model, let's call it. Uh, another model is something somewhat more distributed, where there's um, certain different locations. And the, the user experience, so far as dispensing eyewear, would be very similar to what you currently do. So you go to your local optician, you bring in you, with you your, uh, your script. Uh, you, you select from a range of different frame styles that can accommodate the, uh, the, the projectors and the lenses. Uh, you submit that request to the optician who does a, an on-site fitting. Uh, and then again, that goes away and then is, is um, either surfaced at a regional center rather than a, a national center or, or surfaced even locally. So there's a, there's a couple of different models in play, but for the moment, at least, we're doing everything uh, locally. Um, hi. I, hi. I was wondering, the target use case for this, is this sort of looking at the, um, the slide like a small circle in your eye for like single color text? Or could this be used for, you know, more like 3D model kind of multicolor stuff? Yeah, no, great question. So certainly this is an RGB technology. So the, the hologram I'm wearing right now is, is, is an RGB full color hologram. Um, the field of view is limited, um, so I like to compare it to a smartwatch. We're talking about a technology that's going to give us a field of view that's at least twice a, a typical smartwatch. So we're not talking about a fully immersive experience. This is not a technology that's going to be competitive or, or, or competition for Magic Leap or, or HoloLens. This is something that's meant to give you a little bit of information to, to ease your way through the day. Um, but it will be full color, for sure. Okay, great. Thanks. We should talk afterwards, but um, it's, it's limited for two reasons. So the first is that the eye box is relatively small, which is not a problem if you put the eye box in the right place. You can have a large field of view, but to read text, for instance, you want to have you want to be able to roll the eyeball so that the, the fovea of the eyeball can see the image 
um, and, and resolve the text so things with fine detail. The problem is that when you roll your eyeball, you roll your eye out of the field of, or out of the eye blocks. So that limits the range of, of eye rotations that are allowable. Now, in a lot of situations, that's actually a benefit. So if you're looking for an informatic textual display that's comparable to the size of your, your, your smartphone, and you're walking down the street while doing that, and there's some sort of commotion over here that you need to look at, you don't want to be fumbling around trying to figure out how to turn off the display when you can just roll your eye and you don't see the display anymore. So in a lot of cases, particularly in an all-day use um, capacity, where people are expected to be using this on the go when they're moving around, being able to turn off the display instantly by simply rolling your eye away from the eye box can actually be a benefit. Any other questions? Let's give a hand for Andrew. All right. Thanks, everyone.